Hello there, listeners. Welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 333 of Sustainable Minimalists. On today's show, we are going on a journey, (laughs) and it's going to be a fun journey. It is a journey that most of us have likely been on before, in which we have an appliance, we need it, we rely on it every single day, and then it breaks. What on earth do we do? What should we do? What would a conscious consumer do? My goal today is to arm you with both the knowledge and the resources you need to confidently and intentionally replace appliances the smartest way next time they break, and they will break. Now, before we get there, a couple quick notes. Note number one is this is absolutely positively your last chance to join us on the school bus electrification initiative that we are doing in 2023 here on this podcast as a community. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and listen to episode 331. Uh, Everything you need to know is there. But join us. We're a fun group. We're going to make some real tangible difference. So join us. Shoot me an email. Just say I'm in and I'll add you to the list. Second piece of housekeeping is that, oh my goodness, in the last three weeks of this show, I have gotten more hate lobbed at me than in the past five years of doing this show since the inception. So three weeks more hate than five years. Somebody's mad at me because there was an old Navy ad at the end of a show. Yes, I apologized profusely for that. That shouldn't be there. I have contacted the podcast hosting provider to get them off of my show. Somebody else is mad that I mentioned, literally just mentioned politics. Oh my goodness. Somebody else is mad because they disagree with my opinion. So, okay, so not everybody's mad at me. It sometimes feels that way. Just three people are mad at me. But three people in three weeks, holy moly. That's fine. I'll take it. But it's January now. So let's recenter ourselves. Let's reunify around some universally hated things. Stephanie should not be universally hated. Microplastics, though, should be universally hated. Who likes microplastics? Loud chewing, close talkers. These things should and could be the targets of our frustration and angst with life. How about planned obsolescence? That's what we're talking about today. Planned obsolescence should and is, I would say, universally despised. And that's because it's terrible. So let's reunify around our shared disdain for planned obsolescence. And before we do that, let's go behind the electrical scene. So we're talking about appliances, we're talking about planned obsolescence, but before we can really get down and dirty with all of that, we need to talk about electricity. Appliances get plugged in, which means that their source of energy is, dun dun dun, of course, electricity. So the more you use, the more you pay. The supply and delivery charges of electricity are variable, and you may have heard something in the news recently about increased costs of natural gas means there's an impact on our electric supply, and therefore our energy bills, including our electric bill, are going up. But where does your electricity come from? There's the supplier who supplies the electricity, and then there's the deliverer who gets it from the lines into your home and sends you the bill, right? If you don't know where your electricity comes from, yours specifically, I will tell you that in order to find out that information, you have to jump through (laughs) so many hoops, so many hoops. But that's all to say that in general, I'm guessing that your electricity comes from a variety of sources. So some are renewable, some are clean, wind, solar, right? But some of them are not so clean. They're dirty. They come from coal or natural gas. Now, here in Massachusetts, where I live, the state has set minimum renewable energy requirements. So here in Massachusetts, as of 2022, 51% of all electricity must come from New England sourced renewable energy. And that percentage, 51%, is going up every single year. So by 2030, 87% of electricity must come, must be sourced, I should say, from New England-based renewable sources. So the grid is getting cleaner, but the grid is not clean yet. 
And so when we're looking to buy electronics and appliances, these big bulky things that demand a lot of electricity because we're plugging them into the wall, it makes sense then for us to do two things. Number one, purchase appliances that are energy efficient so they're not wasting electricity. And number two, buy appliances and electronics that are made to last. So we're going to go on that journey I talked about today in which we have an appliance. It's really darn important. We need it every single day. And then one day, dun, 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 it breaks. What is a conscious consumer to do? So let's talk about my laundry machine, my washing machine for a hot minute. I want you to travel back in time to the first days of the pandemic. So we weren't in lockdown yet, but it was coming, right? Everybody was in a state of panic. People are hoarding toilet paper and hand sanitizer. And there's talk about closing schools, but they haven't quite done it yet. So those days, right? Everybody was living on a level of heightened panic. My washing machine died on the day, (laughs) the morning, I should say, that my area of the world went into lockdown. And I said to my husband, oh, heck no, this washing machine is only six years old. It cannot break right now. At the start of a pandemic, nobody knows how long this is going to last. Go to the store right now, buy whatever you can, put it in the trunk. We cannot go without a washing machine. We just can't. Family of four, two messy kids who change their clothes four times a day. No, we need a washing machine. So that's exactly what he did. So the old washing machine was leaking all over the basement. We just moved that to the side. He went to the appliance store. He picked one that was there. No uh, delivery people were delivering anything. So he bought one. He stuck it in the trunk of our car with the trunk open. It was an SUV. So, okay, so he brings it home. He plugs it in. It works. We have a washing machine. Okay, a couple things there. Number one, our broken washing machine lasted for only six years. That's that's the first thing I want you to pay attention to. The f- second thing I want you to pay attention to is that we were not conscious consumers in this situation at all. We did not do our research or our due diligence. We literally bought the first thing we could find. So don't do what I did. Hopefully your washing machine doesn't break on day one of a pandemic. But I'm going to be referring to my washing machine throughout the show. So that's the story. And now when we talk about how long appliances are supposed to last, it's really hard to say. And that's because of planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence is something we talk about often on this show, but just so we're all on the same page, planned obsolescence is a policy of producing appliances and electronics generally that either become obsolete or break prematurely. Some examples of planned obsolescence, the biggest examples include using poorly made parts within the washing machine or within the refrigerator so that the appliance breaks sooner or even better for the company right after the warranty ends, right? It could be not providing an instruction booklet. So you just buy a new vacuum. You think, I don't need the instruction booklet. Who cares that they didn't pack one in this box? It's You just turn it on and vacuum. So easy. But there is important information in that instruction booklet, like how to keep your (laughs) new vacuum cleaner working. Uh, And there's no instruction booklet. Do you really want to spend up to 30 minutes online trying to find the exact instruction booklet for your vacuum cleaner and then print it out, et cetera, et cetera? That's planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence is limited warranties. So your your product that you just paid good money for, let's go ahead and continue on with the vacuum cleaner example. You buy a vacuum cleaner for 365 days, it is covered by a warranty. And then on day 368, <laughs> because of course, the company knows how long that warranty should be. On day 368, one of the little plastic parts inside the vacuum snaps off and breaks and now your vacuum no longer sucks like literally sucks up dirt, (laughs) it sucks that your vacuum no longer sucks, that's planned obsolescence right there. And so again, when we talk about how long things are supposed to last, 
We're more talking about how long they generally last in 2023. Central AC usually lasts about 15 years. Dishwashers, nine-ish years. Microwaves, nine years. Refrigerators last an average of 13 years. Washing machines last an average of 10 years. So I don't know what was going on with my six-year-old and then dying washing machine. Dryers are 13 years. And so again, I really want to drive home the point that it's really difficult to estimate the lifespan of an appliance because the production of individual components within these big bulky appliances are often outsourced to third-party manufacturers and more and more of these Parts, these pieces are made of plastic. 30 years ago, that was not the case. 30 years ago, the parts inside were metal. (laughs) That made the lifespan of those appliances longer. It's my mom, you know, she has appliances that she registered for at her wedding in 1975. She gave me her coffee grinder. She registered and received it as a wedding gift. She no longer grinds coffee, but I do. She gave me her coffee grinder. It is so wonderfully 1970s. I love everything about it, and it still works. Do you think a coffee grinder made in, I don't know, 2005 is working as well as the one made in 1975? I don't know. I do know that I got a coffee grinder for my wedding in 2011, and it broke, and that's why I'm using my mom's. Okay, so you got something. It breaks. What do you do? Well, let's slow down the process. Let's not immediately buy. Let's not immediately send our husband or our partner out to the store to buy what's ever on the showroom floor like I did with the washing machine. I own it. First, try and fix it if time, funds, mental space allows. If you are handy and you feel up to the challenge. There is a DIY fix-it-yourself YouTube video for just about anything. There are WikiHow pages for fixing things. So if you feel up to the challenge, challenge away. I should say, you know, when you learn how to fix stuff yourself, you're teaching yourself an important life skill, self-sufficiency, right? I do not have that skill. Maybe I should work on it in 2023. But if you can't fix it yourself... Try to get the help you need from somebody else. Of course, you're going to contact the brand. You're going to see, you know, if your appliance is still under warranty. If it is, get it fixed. If it's not, inquire about how much it's going to cost to get fixed. Of course, of course, of course. If that's not an option that's available to you, does anybody in your community have the skills that you need? Maybe you can even learn from them. How about a repair cafe? My town senior center does repair cafes. So you bring something that's broken and the beloved seniors who are really good with fixing things will do their best to fix it for you. I have linked in this episode's show notes to the Repair Cafe movement. There are repair cafes all over the world. You can click on your location and see where the closest one is to you. I should also say too here, if you have a local buy nothing group, perhaps you can (laughs) ask somebody to give you the gift of their time in repairing an item. Just see what comes up. You have nothing to lose. Maybe somebody can help you. Maybe they can't, but at least you've checked off all the due diligence boxes. So, okay, you've done your due diligence. No, you can't fix it. Nobody wants to help you. What do you do? Well, you've got to first make sure you're responsibly recycling or discarding of the old appliances. For refrigerators, freezers, and air conditioners, you must hire a professional to remove the refrigerant from the appliance before recycling it. The technician must be, and I quote, Section 608 certified. I should say that under normal circumstances, not a pandemic, if you need to replace your refrigerator or your freezer or your air conditioner, the technician who is coming to install or deliver the new one is likely certified and will take away the old one and properly dispose of it for you. But for the rest of it, for the stuff that doesn't have refrigerant, for the stuff that nobody's coming to haul away for you, I suggest first contacting your local waste management authority to find out where in your location you should bring this stuff. 
The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has a responsible appliance disposal program. I've linked to it in the show notes. So you're probably wondering what happened to my leaky washing machine that we just like stuck in the corner of the basement. We, you know, somebody didn't deliver the new one. So what did we do at the old one? (laughs) Well, it sat there for a good year and a half, I would say. It just sat in the corner staring at me, taunting me. It wasn't very minimalist of me to just leave it there. But I didn't want to put it on the curb to be sent to the landfill. I wanted somebody to do something with it. It was six years old and it just didn't feel right to me that, you know, just because I didn't have the skills to repair this thing meant that it needed to go sit in a trash heap somewhere. That didn't feel right to me. So what did I do? I gave it away for free. I posted it on, I believe it was Craigslist. A very nice gentleman came. He, I don't know what he was going to do with it. I think he was going to strip it for parts, but he came and he took it off my hands for free. I have good faith that this man did something good with my broken washing machine. Okay, so while reusing and repurposing old stuff is generally a good thing, that is Logic does not apply for refrigerators and air conditioners and freezers because of the refrigerant problem. These items tend to contain toxins and pollutants. And so there are times when it does make the most environmental sense to replace certain appliances before they break. So if you have a refrigerator or a freezer made before 1995, It typically has chlorofluorocarbon inside, which is an ozone-depleting substance. It's also a potent greenhouse gas. Refrigerators and freezers made before 2005 may also be insulated with foam that contains ozone-depleting chemicals and, again, greenhouse gases. And appliances made before 1979, so they last. They're really great. They last, right? But not so great because they perhaps contain polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, which are, of course, toxic substances that can pose lots of health risks to your family. So in the case of stuff with refrigerants, refrigerators, freezers, and ACs, if they're old, you may want to consider replacing them even though they still technically work. So that brings us to buying new. We're at the point in the journey where we've either repaired or responsibly disposed of what broke, and now we're on to the part in the journey where we need to buy new. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we're going to talk about everything we need to know next time we buy an appliance. Organic and truly healthy food choices at my local supermarket are sadly limited. And more times than not, I find myself forced to either fork over an awful lot of money or compromise my food values. These days, Thrive Market is my go-to for grocery staples, and that's because I can always find exactly what I'm looking for for less money. Here's a quick example. Primal Kitchen is my go-to brand for ketchup because their ketchup is made with organic ingredients and without pesky hidden sugar. Its sticker price is $6.69 at my local grocery store. But at Thrive Market, the same exact product is over $1 less. Join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash sustainable for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash sustainable. Thrivemarket.com slash sustainable. We talk about laundry detergent an awful lot on this podcast, so you already know that those gigantic plastic detergent jugs rarely get recycled, and over 700 million jugs wind up in our landfills every single year. Yikes. EarthBreeze EcoSheets solve the plastic jug problem and go further. For me in my home, I love that EarthBreeze's formula actually cleans 
my clothes because ain't nobody wants to do laundry twice. (laughs) And the fact that their packaging is completely plastic free is the cherry on top. If you don't like their detergent sheets for whatever reason, they will give you a full refund and you don't even have to send the product back. Right now, my listeners can subscribe and get 40% off. Go to earthbreeze.com slash sustainable to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash sustainable for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash sustainable. If you're not sleeping on bed sheets with viscose from bamboo yet, what on earth are you waiting for? I used to be a cotton bed sheets type of girl, and then I tried Caraloha's soft and sustainable bedding made from viscose from bamboo. You guys, the difference is huge. It is one of the softest and comfiest fabrics on the planet. They're also cooler. Viscose from bamboo fabrics are three degrees cooler than non-bamboo fabrics, and they're naturally moisture wicking, which means they're lightweight and breathable. And even my husband, who, let's be real, he generally does not care too much about our bed sheets, but even he prefers our Caraloha sheets over our humdrum cotton ones. Caraloha is giving our listeners 25% off their order by using code SUSTAINABLE. The code does not last forever, so hurry and head to C-A-R-I-L-O-H-A dot com and use code SUSTAINABLE to receive 25% off your order. And we're back on today's show. We are discussing conscious consumer habits when we go to purchase appliances. We're talking about the right to repair movement. We're talking about everything in between. And we are now on to the part of today's conversation where we talk about how on earth do you smartly buy a new appliance? Where do you start? Do you go to the showroom and you buy the best looking, the sleekest one on the showroom floor? No, that, the answer is no, by the way. <laughs> Do you buy the cheapest one? The answer is it depends on your funds. What should a conscious consumer do if the conscious consumer lives in an ideal world with unlimited time and unlimited funds? Well, Step one is to, of course, do your research, okay? I have to give a shout out to consumer reports here. I have writers and researchers on the show from consumers reports often because they offer unbiased ratings of over 9,000 products and especially appliances. So unbiased means that no company is paying them to get a good review. Okay, that's really important. Consumer reports, you can pay $10 a month or $60 a year to get unfettered access to their unbiased reviews. This is a great gift idea, by the way. If you have somebody in your life, they need a gift. $60 a year for consumer reports. Uh, Amazing. Really smart. Or, you know, perhaps you take that $60 and you split it with somebody in your life and you both get access to consumer reports. Great idea. And the reason it's a great idea is because if you buy the right appliance, if you do your research and your due diligence on the front end, you're going to be saving a heck a lot more than $60 down the line because you're going to hopefully buy something that's made to last, that has a good warranty, (laughs) that is worth your hard-earned money. Okay, so Consumer Reports is a great place to go to find the best appliance. I have mentioned on the show before buymeonce.com. I've linked to them in the show notes. Also, the site has changed a bit in the past few years since I first mentioned them. If you are a ride or die listener, you know that when my blender broke after, I don't know, maybe like eight years, I went to buymeonce.com. I looked at their recommendations for a blender. I ended up buying what they recommended. And so I've had that blender now for about five years and I love it. It's been a really smart purchase on my end. However, buymeonce.com has now definitely become more of an e-commerce site and they're selling fewer appliances. They're more selling pots and pans and bed linens and stuff like that. And so you buy directly through them. I'm not saying that you know, the change is bad or negative. I am just saying that it's a change because there are indeed far fewer appliances that are recommended on the site these days. So, okay, so those are two sites. 
that you could go to to start doing your due diligence. There are many sites. Then what else are you going to do when you're in the store, when you're actually perusing? You are going to do what conscious consumers are trained to do, and that's to look for those third-party labels, those certifications. So in this section of today's show, we're going to be talking about what exactly Energy Star is and what exactly Energy Guide is. What are these things? Why do they matter? Do they matter? Are they gimmicks? Well, it makes sense, remember, because the grid is getting cleaner. The electrical grid is getting cleaner, but it's not clean yet. It makes sense to buy an appliance that is Energy Star rated, that uses the least amount of energy under the Energy Guide. Energy Star, I should say, does have a list on its website of products that are recognized for being the most efficient and beat the minimum standard. So I've listed that in the show notes as well this week. But what on earth is Energy Star? Energy Star is a certification program for products. And when a product is Energy Star certified, That means that the product has met strict energy efficiency criteria that's set by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, or the U.S. Department of Energy. It's a small blue sticker. It's really cute. There's a star on it. It's like a shooting star. Now, the program is voluntary, so not all products have to be Energy Star tested and rated, right? It's voluntary. A company sends a pre-production model of what they're hoping to sell to Energy Star Labs. The lovely technicians at Energy Star will test the product for energy efficiency. The same company must also agree to allow for off-the-shelf testing once the product does go to market. Now, Energy Star doesn't just do appliances. It can do light bulbs and windows and buildings. We're talking about appliances in this episode, so let's talk about appliances. Refrigerators that have the Energy Star certification are at least 15% more efficient than the minimum federal efficiency standard. TVs consume three watts or less when turned off compared to a standard television, which consumes six watts on average when turned off. Office equipment, so computers, printers, etc. In order to be Energy Star certified, they must have a low power or sleep mode when they're inactive. And so it's important for me to really just be clear in saying that when you purchase an Energy Star certified appliance, that can save you money in the long term because number one, lower energy bills. And also, in some cases, cities and states and perhaps even the federal government may have incentive programs that entice you to purchase energy-efficient appliances. So what does that all mean? That means tax credits in some cases. Now, Energy Star is not the same as Energy Guide. Energy Guide is that gigantic yellow sticker that you see on appliances (laughs) that tells you with a sliding scale, kind of like a bar graph, exactly how much energy this appliance, whatever the sticker is stuck to, is going to use in a year, how much money that is going to cost you to run. And of course, the less energy an appliance uses, the less it costs to run every single day. So the Energy Guide label provides an estimate as to how much electricity the appliance will use annually. It also gives an estimate as to how much money it's going to cost to put electricity into the appliance to run. Although, again, that is an estimate because, remember, electricity rates are variable. The Federal Trade Commission here in the United States requires that these labels are placed on certain appliances, dishwashers, refrigerators, freezers, washing machines, HVAC equipment. And so just because you see the energy guide, the big yellow sticker, that does not mean it's positively rated. Okay, that's important. Energy star, if you see that, it means it's positively rated. But if you see just the big yellow energy guide sticker, that says nothing about whether it is energy efficient. So just to recap, we are going to buy new. We are going to, number one, Do your research from home. Don't do your research on the showroom floor. Do your research from home. The internet is your friend. Go to any reputable site. 
Then once you get some sort of idea as to the direction your journey is going to take, then you go to the showroom and you double check for an Energy Star logo, third-party certification, and you are also going to read the Energy Guide. Okay, that should set you up for appliance purchasing success. We are going to take our second break today because this is a really long show. And when we come back, I'm excited to answer listener Kara's question about where exactly the right to repair movement stands today in the U.S. legislature. So we'll get there after a quick ad break. And we are back. We are on to part three of today's show where we are discussing the right to repair legislation. Where are we at? Listener Kara wrote to me and she's asked if I could please do an episode on the maintenance and repair of appliances. She would like me specifically to cover topics such as the repair cafe movement and right to repair legislation, as well as things we should all be doing to help our appliances run more efficiently and last longer. Okay, so let's take part one of Kara's question, which is repair cafe. I mentioned it earlier in the show, But let's really parse that out. A repair cafe is a free meeting location where you will find the tools and materials and the help that you need to repair what's broken. Repair Cafe started in Amsterdam in 2009, and since then, over 2,500 repair cafes have opened worldwide. Again, I listed the map in the show notes so you can find one near you. And of course, if you have one near you, Go on with your bad self and use it. Repair cafes repair skills in society. So giving you self-sufficient life skills reduces waste, keeps stuff out of landfill, and promotes the repair movement, right? That repairing is yet another skill that we are in danger of losing. I could go on with a lot of other skills we're in danger of losing, but I'll leave that for another day. Repair Cafe's website, so if you don't have one near you, like a physical location, the website has thousands of repair guides, which provide the instructions on how to do a variety of tasks. So check that out if you have something that's broken. And know, too, that almost anything that's broken, not just appliances, can be brought to a repair cafe. According to their website, you can bring clothing and furniture and toys and you know, you have nothing to lose. So if you have one, it's free, bring it down. Maybe it gets fixed. Maybe it doesn't. You have nothing to lose. This brings me now to right to repair legislation. What on earth is our right to repair? Well, our right to repair means that if we own something, we should have the right to repair it ourselves or take it to a technician of our choice. That's our right as an owner of this thing. In the European Union and in France specifically, so our neighbors across the pond, they are doing right to repair correctly. In the EU, manufacturers of lighting, washing machines, dishwashers, and refrigerators are required to supply spare parts for their machines for up to 10 years. Wow. I wish we had that here in the U.S., right? In France, they take it a step further. Further, France requires manufacturers of certain electronics to let consumers know how repairable their products are based on what they call a repairability index. So can you imagine going to buy your new phone, your phone breaks, you go to the store and there's a repairability index, which tells you how hard or how easy it is to repair the phone when it inevitably breaks? That sounds lovely, right? Now, what's going on here in the United States? Well, the Repair Association, which is a right to repair advocacy group, believes manuals should be available, software licenses shouldn't be limited, parts and tools should be available for people who want to repair, unlocking of items should be legalized so that we can install our own custom software, and devices should be designed in a way as to make repair possible. So that's what the Repair Association advocates for, but is it happening? The answer, sadly, is no. If you go to the Repair Association's website, which I did, and I highly suggest you do it as well, they have a map of the 50 states, and it's color-coded, right? You can 
click on your state or just visually see the states that have passed right to repair legislation, the states that have an active bill in their state legislature right now, and the states that have had one in the past that failed, and then states that have never had a bill anywhere ever. (laughs) So in terms of states that have right to repair bills passed, there's only two of them. And I'm looking at you, Colorado, and I'm looking at you, New York. New York has a bill that has currently passed in the state Senate, but it only covers digital electronic equipment. And in Colorado, they also have a law passed, but it only covers the right to repair wheelchairs. Then the next is the red state. So the states that have an active right to repair bill. There's maybe, I don't know, 15 of them. Massachusetts, my state is one of them. There is a bill currently up for a vote in my state. However, it's important to mention here that although 20-ish states, my state included, does have active legislation introduced, many companies do, of course, surprise to no one, lobby against right to repair legislation. They argue that if independent contractors are allowed to make repairs on their products, there are supposed security risks associated with that. However, there's little to no evidence that that is indeed true. And of course, right, it does not take a genius to realize that companies don't want their products repaired. They want them broken so that we go to the store and we become repeat customers and we give them more of our money. So here in the U.S., we are far behind Europe in this regard, under pressure from tech companies and equipment manufacturers Lots of state bills with regard to right to repair have not been passed and do not get passed. Now, if you want to join the movement, you can do so at repair.org. I will link to that in the show notes as well. You just, you know, give them your information. You join their free mailing list. You can unsubscribe at any time. They give you the resources you need to contact your elected officials so that they hopefully pass these right to repair bills through. Because when these right to repair bills do get passed, that's more power, more freedom for you, the consumer. And so I would be remiss today if we didn't quickly cover caring for your current appliances to extend their lives, right? None of this is revolutionary. Let me say that at the outset. Think of it less as revolutionary tips and more as friendly reminders. Because again, how often do we all religiously do this stuff, right? When it comes to any appliance or any electronic, make sure you're reading the manufacturer's instruction booklet. (laughs) There's important information there, not just about how to work the thing, but how to take care of it. So make sure you have that instruction booklet. Make sure you read it at least once. If it doesn't come in the box, Do that 20-minute searching online, find it, read it, etc. For refrigerators and freezers, vacuum the unit's compressor coils at least twice a year, more than twice a year if you have pets that shed. If they get overly dirty or dusty, it is difficult for the appliance, the refrigerator, the freezer, to stay cool, and that will lead to early breakage. Check the rubber gasket on the fridge or freezer door, and if there's lots of crumbs, The seal is compromised, which means air leaks out. And then finally, if you have a fridge that's not built into the wall, position it so that it's at least one inch away from the wall. That will give it the room it needs to cool properly. So the coils in the back, they can cool. For your microwave, clean it. If there's too much dirt caked down the inside of the microwave, That will lead to electrical sparking, which nobody wants ever, right? You can clean your microwave slightly easier by placing a container of water inside, microwaving it for a little while, maybe two minutes, maybe three minutes. The steam will accumulate in the microwave. Then you can wipe it down inside. For stoves and ovens and ranges, keep the surface clean. Use the self-cleaning function on your oven. Do it more than once every five years, right? Do it, do it fairly often. When it gets gross, self-clean. Clean the vent hood filter because that often does build up with grease and oil. For your dishwasher, like you do have to do some pre-rinsing, all right? I know, you know, we don't want to waste water. So 
find what works for you between not rinsing at all and having tons of food debris clogging the inside of your dishwasher and washing too much and just wasting water and wasting your time by pre-cleaning. There is a happy middle there and find it for you. When it comes to dishwasher maintenance, you do not want tons of food um, clogging up the drain in there. Absolutely not. If you have a filter on your dishwasher, make sure you're cleaning it out regularly. And then finally, for washing machines and dryers, I think this is the problem, bringing this conversation full circle to my washing machine that died after six years. I think I overfilled it with something that I shouldn't have overfilled it with. I was washing the, oh gosh, I hope my husband doesn't hear this. I was washing the covers to um, outdoor furniture. And it was, you know, heavy, thick material. I think I put too much of all that in and I think I destroyed the drum. I think that's why my washing machine broke early. I'm not sure. But nevertheless, it did break early and I was mad about it. Uh, So make sure you don't overload your washing machine or your dryer. This will damage the belts. It'll damage the drum. It'll damage moving things. If you have a filter in your washing machine, clean it often. Definitely clean out your dryer vent, not only for maintenance of the dryer, but also so you don't get a house fire. I just learned the other day, the number one cause of house fires is unclean dryer vents. Oh my goodness, just clean it. Just do it. Sometimes clean out the tube too, the big metal tube that vents outside. Get your vacuum out. Clean that out as well. And finally, if your dryer is not drying like it used to, remove the filter, clean it with warm water and a tiny little bit of soap. Even if your filter looks clean to your eyes, there may be a nearly invisible layer of lint buildup, which is preventing the dryer from functioning properly. So keep your stuff clean, keep your stuff maintenanced, and remember the final word for today's episode, which is that at the end of the day, we can all only do the best we can. We can all only at the end of the day, honor our best intentions. Don't take the weight of the world on your own shoulders. The manufacturers that put goods into the marketplace that are made to break, that are made with cheap parts and don't have any plan for recovering this cheaply made stuff, they're to blame at the end of the day and they're the ones that should be feeling the guilt, not you and I. So we do what's in our power. We do what we can. We advocate for right to repair legislation via repair.org. We take care of the stuff we have. We make conscious purchasing decisions when we need to buy new. And we make sure that the stuff that breaks is responsibly discarded to the best of our ability. That's all we can do at the end of the day so much information in this episode. I am really tired of talking and I need some water. I am going to say goodbye. I will see you on Tuesday where in honor of Veganuary, we are discussing the ins and outs of raising plant-based kids. I will see you then. Reach out if you need me. I hope we're all unified now and take care.